morning, everybody. On behalf of uh, Judges Reardon and Yates, I want to welcome you to this session of the Court of Appeals. It looks like most of the lawyers here that are scattered in the group um, have been here before, but just a friendly reminder um, that we are very familiar with the uh, facts, the arguments, that what happened in the trial court. We've not only had the benefit of your briefs, but also an internal research memo or bench memorandum. So please take that into consideration um, when making your arguments. And please do not use the name of any minors uh, since these are being recorded and posted on the internet. Um, so with that, we'll call the first case. First two cases are consolidated. Docket number 362210, People versus James Crumbly and docket number 362211, People versus Jennifer Crumbly. This is Defendant's Appeal. Good morning, Your Honors. Marielle Lehman on behalf of Defendant Appellate James Crumbly. Okay. And good morning. I'm Sharon Smith on behalf of Defendant Appellate Jennifer Crumbly. How are you going to spend your time? You have a half hour total. Your Honor, I will um, be arguing and reserving some time for rebuttal. Okay, well, how much time? Are you going to be doing 15 minutes each? Yes. Okay. You, Thank you for that. And it's the court, not you guys, by the way. All right, well, let's proceed. Good morning, Your Honors. In this case, the prosecution has failed to point to a single case in which, under this context, an individual can be held criminally responsible for the calculated, planned, intentional, deliberate acts of another person. Here, EC planned, carried out, and, and deliberately intended to cause the deaths of the individuals in this case. But our standard is awfully deferential, isn't it? It's an abuse of discretion to start with, and it's a probable cause standard coming out of the preliminary examination, right? That's correct, Your Honor. And our position is, in this case, the prosecution has failed to even meet the probable cause standard as it relates to causation on behalf of James Crumbly. James Crumbly had no knowledge of what EC was planning. He was had called over to the school that day, wasn't he? He was. He had knowledge then. He had knowledge that there was a drawing, but had no knowledge of what EC was planning to do that day or at any other point. Certainly a warning signal, wouldn't you say? It could be a warning sign that EC may have been troubled or may have been having certain thoughts, but not a warning sign that he was going to kill four other people. Warning. Oh. Go ahead. Sorry, warning sign that maybe he had access to a gun? James Crumbly did not know that EC had access to that firearm. He bought him the gun. Well, and the first thing he did when he heard about the school shooting was go back home to see if the gun was there. So it certainly was on the top of his head. Mr. Crumbly went home and did check to see if his firearm was there and realized that it wasn't. Right. Well, here's, I, I have a question. On, on the whole intervening cause, superseding cause thing, um, in most of the cases, except for, I guess, people versus head, um, the, the third party or the victim that is supposedly the intervening cause or superseding cause, there's no relation between the defendant and that third party or the, or the victim. And here, there's obviously a, a significant connection, and the argument I think the prosecution is making, at least in part, is that both defendants um, kind of greased it so that this led to what EC did. So there, there's. So how do you how do you deal with that when there's not a, like a separate third party or victim situation, which there are in most cases? The prosecution's theories in this case extend beyond the parent-child relationship. The prosecution's theories in this case don't require a parent-child relationship, but again, extend beyond that relationship. So to answer your question more directly. It wouldn't matter under the prosecution's theories whether there was a third-party victim who, who was an intervening superseding cause or not. 
under the prosecution's theories, their criminal liability can extend beyond just the parent-child relationship. It's not specific to parent, the parent-child relationship. What are we supposed to do with the head case? In the head case, that was an unintentional shooting. Um, in the head case, the minor was 10 years old at the time of the shooting. There were some facts in that case regarding the storage of the firearm that were different than in this case. And again, that was an unintentional shooting that the defendant was held responsible for. In our case, we have an intentional, planned, deliberate shooting of multiple people. But in the head case, there really wasn't any indication that there was going to be a problem. It's just negligence. As Judge Reardon pointed out here, there were warning signs all over the place. In the head case, um, the liability was conferred upon the defendant based on his improper storage of a loaded firearm. Um, that is different than in this case. And obviously and some of those facts have not come out yet. Causation in head was more because, like you said, I mean, the court kept saying it was accident, accidental shooting. And I thought generally the rule is if it's negligence, then it's foreseeable. Um, and when it's intentional, it's generally not. But you do recognize that it's not a hard and fast rule, right, with respect to intentional acts. In the head case, the context was that the minors were playing in the room where the loaded, stored, improperly stored firearm was. Um, I believe that the court conferred liability onto the defendant based on what could be foreseeable in an accidental shooting, right. not in a deliberate, intentional shooting as we have in this case. Right, and that's why we would distinguish head on that basis. But you do recognize that still the, the rule that an intentional act is an intervening superseding cause is not an absolute rule, it's the general rule, correct? It may be a broad general rule, but there are some, there's some maneuvering in there. I would say that it, it is a general rule, but it is also the governing rule about right. inverting superseding causes. But isn't the touchstone foreseeability, not negligence, as opposed to an intentional act? I mean, at the end of the day, aren't we looking at foreseeability more than anything else to determine whether there can be criminal liability that attaches? The prosecution's position is that the shootings in this case were foreseeable by James Crumbly. Um, the defense's position is that they weren't foreseeable. So the court can look at foreseeability, but just having a, a child or a minor who may engage in strange or questionable behavior doesn't necessarily mean that a parent or any individual can foresee that they're going to carry out a premeditated murder of one or multiple people. If that's what all this case was about, you might be right. But that's not all it is. I mean, it's, it's, it seems like it would be pretty hard for you to overcome what Judge Reardon mentioned, which is when they get to the school and they're presented with all that information and with the background information about his mental health situation and his calling out to the parents to try to get help and not receiving it and his interest in guns and shooting and and then when you add in what occurred at the school uh, this is not just a parents dealing with a mental health issue it's much more than that wouldn't you agree or no i i would respectfully slightly disagree with that position um, and the reason that i would slightly disagree is because in this case, we do dispute, obviously, overall, some of the facts that were presented at the preliminary exam. But for the purpose of this argument, some of the information that was presented were text messages um, to a third party, or a fourth party, if, if you will, that the, Mr. Crumbly had no knowledge of. Um, Did the they, text messages to the friend, is that what you're referring to? Correct. Okay. And it is in those text messages that EC claims that he was having these issues and that his father or parents were failing to provide him with, with care or taking him to a doctor, but there's been no information or evidence presented by the prosecution at the exam or otherwise that James Crumbly knew um, that there was an issue or a concern. What um, about the math worksheet? The math worksheet. Yes. The math homework that was presented on the day of the shooting. Right. I mean, both of the parents clearly understood that that was a major problem. And they went to the school. Mr. Crumbly spoke with, um, with the school counselor and with people at the school. And it was indicated to him at that time, and I believe that the testimony also came out at exam, is that it was indicated to Mr. Crumbly at that point that there were no concerns about Ethan harming anyone else, that the concern was that he may harm him. I'm, 
EC may harm himself, and um, that it was best in that he be around other people and that he not be alone. So while the math homework may have been um, a, a concern on some level, it again was not foreseeable from the drawings on that homework that he was going to later carry out the premeditated murders of those students. Um, even the testimony that was presented at exam was that based on the experience and knowledge and education of the counselor that he felt that the concern was more for EC's well-being um, and not the well-being of other people. He didn't have a concern about the safety of other people. Well, I'll give you this. Um, that in, I, I guess the text messages about his hallucinations, about the young man's hallucinations, they were in March, I, I believe, where he texted his mother. And from the record that I, I saw there that I've read, the mother informed the father that there were the, the kid was having some hallucinations. Now, it's eight months between then and uh, in November when when the tragedy happened. But certainly, the father was put on notice then that the child or the the young person was having some pretty s significant mental issues. And in those eight months. To James Crumbly's knowledge, there was no, there were no other issues. There were no other text messages. There were no other alleged hallucinations. There were no other behavioral issues. Up to, um, obviously, the phone call that was received by Mrs. Crumbly on November 29th, and then November 30th. And the alarm bells went off with that phone call between both of them. At least the the, the text messages going back and forth. And I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. Also, the journal, the parents had no knowledge about that, the videos, those kind of things. They, they had no knowledge about that. But you said something. They had access to it, though. Ex well, they, they had access, but they didn't fully have knowledge to it. But you said something interesting when you started out. You said that because no other, <clears throat> uh, we, we, this is a unique fact situation, I, I think I'm paraphrasing you. No other court has ever charged parents in a situation like this that, the Oakland, Oakland County, or that we can't affirm the trial court because no one else, we can't set precedent? Is that what you're saying? No, that's not what I'm saying. Uh, I believe what I said was that the prosecution can't point to any other cases in which a, an individual, not just a parent, but an individual has been charged for the intentional premeditated killings by, by one person. I'm not attempting to imply that this court can't set precedent. However, what I am saying is that it hasn't happened in the past and shouldn't happen now. The causation is, is clear. The law on causation is clear and it is, and has been well established um, in our state. And in this case, there is no causation. But I mean, there's factual causation for sure, right? No, I, I, would, I would argue that there's no factual causation either. You would say there's no proximate cause? Yes, there's no proximate cause. But but for is so easy to me. And, and it, but for them not taking him out of the school that day, it wouldn't have occurred that day. And that's basically all you need to do to, for factual causation. I would agree with that, that okay. the but for is easy to prove. However, I would still, I would still maintain that there is no factual causation. <clears throat> the but for can be extended to, to a number of, to well beyond where it should be. But for the fact that he was born, it may never have happened. Right, but they, well, they bought him the gun. Again, we, we dispute that fact. Well, you, you, I understand that that has been stated by the prosecution repeatedly, but we do respute. Uh, Counsel, you, you've used 12 minutes of your 15 minutes. Do you want to reserve the last for a I would. Yes, okay. Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, obviously, there could not be a more horrific case and set of facts before this court um, for you to decide. And I'm keeping my cheat sheet in front of me to not use the minor's name because I have a bad habit of that. Um, if I, I can speak or I can take questions, whichever you prefer. Go ahead and make your argument. Okay, so in this case, I think the most important uh, case that's <coughs> out there is the Zach case, which was cited too heavily in the defense's reply. And in that Zach case, it was very instructive that when... Um, a person commits a free uh, and deliberate shooting of a victim, they become the proximate cause of the victim's death. 
And in that case, at the time the shooting took place in Zach, the Zach was with the person who actually shot the gun. Zach was responsible for having given that gun to that person. So there was not a parental relationship, but at least enough of a relationship that Zach was more involved in that set of factual circumstances than Mr. and Mrs. Crumbly were with their son EC. But you, you can't just cut off. You can't just cut off liability at the proximate cause. I mean, the governmental tort liability does that for immunity, but it, it's never been my understanding that if you're a proximate cause, you're nonetheless freed because somebody is the proximate cause. You you have to argue an intervening cause, right? Well, in in this case, we believe that. Uh, EC was an intervening and superseding cause. And the, the reason is because, and these facts are not disputed, his age makes a difference. This is not a case where we're talking about a child unintentionally shooting a gun. We're talking about a 16-year-old uh, who wrote elaborate and deliberate plans in a journal that, that he only knew about. We're talking about a person who had... Um, thoughts and problems, whether people knew about them or not, we had a person who put together this plan of who he was going to shoot, what order he was going to do it in, how he was going to do it. And until the prosecution can show that the parents were more a part of knowing that was the plan and that it was foreseeable, he would actually take a gun and shoot other people. Um, they'd be charged as aiders and abettors, and that's, that's obviously not the facts in this case. But what about Judge Murray's point about what they learned when they went to the school? Because you have that math worksheet, which is so troubling, and they both understood that, that was tremendously troubling. And yet, they came into the school, true, good for them, but then they just left, didn't hug him, left the school, left him in for the rest of the day. So that's the math worksheet. Is, if I can just tag on sure. one thing to Judge Yates. They also didn't look in the backpack. Okay, so with that, when they went to the school that day, I agree with you 100% that that math worksheet is troubling, and I'm the parent of four kids, and if I saw that, I, I would absolutely have a strong reaction. I completely agree. There was also testimony at the exam that there was more than an hour and a half conversation between EC and the people at the school and his parents, and that everyone was convinced EC was not a threat to other people's safety, according to people at the school and the parents, when the parents left him at school that day, if any concern, it was a suicidal concern for Ethan, I'm sorry, EC on himself. Well, so let's take, yes, there was suicidal concerns, and the counselor was worried about that he might have been, may have been suicidal. At that point, wouldn't that warrant looking in the backpack? If he's suicidal and he has access to a gun? I appreciate that idea, and I think Judge Murray raises a great point. The problem is, is that what we're doing is looking at this case backwards through a lens of what should have happened, what could have happened, what would have changed things had things happened. And that's not the way our law I don't uh, think that's what we're work. looking at. What we're looking at is what actions or inactions did the two defendants have that led to this shooting? Well, not, we're not second-guessing them. We're just seeing what things did they do or not do that led to these events? Because that's, that's causation, right? Well, the, the thing they did not do is plot and plan these murders and hold a weapon and shoot people in cold blood in a school. Can you stay behind the podium, please? I'm so, I'm so sorry. Right. Sorry. And that's that's the main point. That's what they did not do. Um, anything else they could have done, like get him into therapy sooner, look in his backpack, go through his cell phone, um, go through his room, pick apart anything, those are all mm -hmm. things that, in hindsight, parents always wish they had done when a problem occurs or they find something like this out. The problem is, is that extending that kind of liability for failure to open a backpack or failure to give a hug or failure to do one of those things ends up opening this unlimited liability to every parent across the state. If I have a child that goes and has sex with an underage girl, do I as the parent then become liable for criminal sexual conduct 
because my child used the cell phone I technically own, drove the car I technically own, and I knew my son had an affinity to like girls. But, but that's a different situation. You usually have a relatively high mens rea requirement. This is involuntary manslaughter, which is malice-free homicide. And, and, and in this sort of case, all we're really looking for is foreseeability, aren't we? I mean, I, we'll grant you that you have to show factual cause and proximate cause. I think factual cause, at least under probable cause standard, is not even worth discussing today. But in terms of proximate cause, isn't it just simply a question of foreseeability? And as Judge Murray says, something beyond negligence can be foreseeable. And it seems to me these sorts of facts are exactly where it would be foreseeable. The, the problem with the foreseeability argument in this case um, is that there are so many things you could point to that could be foreseeable or not, but at the end of the day, it truly wasn't foreseeable that EC was going to take this gun and shoot people. It was not foreseeable to his parents. They are the last people on earth that would want to, first of all, have their son locked up in prison the rest of his life for committing such a heinous, horrible act. And second, to see the death of other kids in the community, it clearly is not foreseeable to any parent because if they did foresee their child doing that, there would be so many things that would be stopped. And in this case, it was not foreseeable. It was nowhere on their radar until after the fact and through the lens of 2020, they were able to start seeing uh, things that they looked back on that were, that <clears throat> were missteps and, and things that they wish they could change. Look, my wife always rolls her eyes at me when I talk about the slippery slope, but it is a valid concern. You know, I know our cases are supposed to be used based on the facts that we that are at issue, but I think it is a valid concern about um, the precedent that this will establish because we know lawyers who are smart and crafty will use this case uh, to argue something down the future that is not as um, compelling and and lead to issues that you, you mentioned about parental criminal responsibility for the intentional acts of their children. Um, so it's a good point and it's it's hard to grapple with, but. Well, it's particularly hard to grapple with in this case where I will concede that these parents made tremendously bad decisions. I will concede that these parents were ill-equipped in many ways to handle various factors in this case. But criminal trials for criminal culpability are not based on whether parents make the right decisions or do the right things. Right, but aren't you here too early with that argument? I mean, if you were here after a trial arguing sufficiency of the evidence, then it's an entirely different standard. We're trying to decide whether there's proof beyond a reasonable doubt. You're here challenging a bind-over decision which requires only probable cause. And even with only probable cause, I believe the standard has not been met um, because of the issue of the intervening, intervening and superseding cause of Ethan Crumbly shooting the gun. So I, it's not only a sufficiency of the evidence argument that I believe this case would warrant should there be a conviction, it's also the defense's position that there, there is not enough to support a probable cause when there is such a flagrant intervening and superseding cause, not by an eight-year-old coming in and doing something, not by someone who says, I'm gonna kill that person and goes and does it, but by a 16-year-old who was deceptive, kept it a secret, had this plan, and, and executed it, which is unfathomable. Well, our standard is abuse of discretion, and that's, that's a fair, fairly low standard, wouldn't you agree? I do. Now, the, the prosecution is saying that the parents had a, a legal duty, I think they wrote in their brief. What, what was the legal duty in your, was there a legal duty, or what, what do you, what's your understanding of legal duty? So one of the arguments uh, that I have made that's pending in the trial court currently is that there was not a legal duty for EC's parents to other people at the school. And there's some tort cases that discuss how parents have liability to keep their children under control. But in the criminal context, the defense doesn't concede that there was a legal duty. Because when you look at a legal duty, it has to be to the people that are harmed or to a certain group of people. 
as a parent, I don't owe a legal duty to every kid at my four kids' schools. I don't owe a legal duty to every person my, my child encounters on the street. So there are cases where, like, for example, a child burned down an apartment building and it was found to be involuntary manslaughter because there was a lease agreement that required the tenant to keep the people in the building safe. Her kid had a history of lighters and candles and burnt the building down and killed people. That case is very different. In this case, um, we haven't briefed out all the legal duty because we just haven't gotten there quite yet. We, uh, the defense does not believe there is a legal duty. Well, we, we have some cases, uh, this case call involving termination of parental rights. Don't parents have a legal duty for the welfare of their children? They do have a duty for the welfare of their children, but that does not uh, extend to the welfare of their children and every action they have with every person they could in encounter on this earth. Well, what troubles me in this situation, granted, I, I think all of us here on the, on the bench are parents, and it sounds like you're a parent too, and it's a very difficult thing. It's the hardest thing I think any of us do, and full of second guessing all the time, you know, even if your kids don't go down the wrong path. Your Honor, may I also say that... So let me finish oh, my question, sure. all right? Um, the situation here, when they were called in on that Thursday, uh, they knew their son had some, some serious issues. They had been dealing with him for eight months with those issues. The counselor thought he was suicidal. Why not take a look in the backpack? They don't want him to harm himself. Do the parents have a duty to, to keep their own child from harm? You're saying they don't have a duty to keep uh, to keep him from harming other people, but don't they have a duty to keep their child from harming himself? Well, first I would say if this were a case of termination of parental rights, there's obviously different standards. Absolutely, and, I agree. And, and there has not been a petition filed against it's, these no, parents. I'm just using that as an analogy. Okay, okay there's, there's not a petition filed, though, for parental rights, and so to be truthful... Well, he's being and, tried as an adult anyway, but go ahead. Well, there was. He, he was charged as an adult. Right, he was charged as an adult. So the parental termination <clears throat> issue, um, well, I see what the court's saying. There are some little nuances. As far as looking in the bag... Um, I'm not going to dispute the facts of the case with you that there were troubling text messages and then there was this, he might be suicidal, um, and that the defense at trial is going to have counter arguments about what those texts were about and why there were texts about Ethan having hallucinations and things along those lines. Um, so I, I won't get into what our defense would be on those issues. I'll just tell you we have a defense. Um, but even if you accept all of that is true, there is still no legal duty to look in a bag. There's no legal duty to look in a locker. How far does that legal duty extend? Would it go to a car? Would it require you to go through their room? I, well, legal, I'm sure the parents you. wish they had looked in that yeah, bag. Certainly, we all wish we would have And done. the thing is, the school went and got the bag from the classroom. The school um, personnel carried that bag down to the office where Ethan was sitting to talk to him, and they had physical possession of that bag, and they also didn't look in that bag. And based on what the school knew with the math paper, with the carrying the bag, and seeing they commented about how heavy the bag was, all those well, things the combined. School's, the school's not charged. Well, it makes okay. it, the right. prosecution's the theory makes it so they could be. Well, yeah, I, well, you have a valid argument there. And I've thought that myself, but the school's not charged here. The individuals at the school have not been charged. And they very well, maybe they could have been charged. What do parents, what duty do parents have of any to their children? Answer me that. So the question is different when you say what duty do they have to their children? What legal duty do we have to children? Well, we have the duties under the Child Protection Code to get them medical care, give them food, give them um, help, you know, education, things along those lines. That would lines. include mental health care? And that does include mental health care. The first time that mental health care was discussed was at the school during the meeting that day. The first time the word suicide was used during the meeting that day at the school, and the trained professional counselor 
allowed, you can't just leave your child at school if they say your child has to go. I had a child throw up at school once. I said, my kid drank too much pop. Let them stay there. He just needs to let his stomach settle. He's going to be fine. And they said, no, if your child throws up, you have to take them home and they can't come back for 24 hours. EC was allowed to stay at school based on a trained mental health professional professionals discussion with EC and with those parents. Didn't they recommend that the parents remove him from school that day? No, well, that's a contested fact at issue, but the obvious answer is that they didn't demand he be removed because he wasn't removed. He was allowed to stay at the school. He was <coughs> allowed to be there the rest of the day. There was something that they wanted him to get mental health treatment within 48 hours with a therapist, and the parents agreed to do that and took the mental health services list of therapists with them when they left the school that day. Um, it was something you know they very much intended to do. So this is not a case where over and over these parents have failed to get the care for their child they needed to do. But if that is the case, they should be facing a petition in juvenile court or in the juvenile jurisdiction of the court for termination of parental rights based on their harm to their child. Okay, thank you. Your time, your, your time is expired. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court. Joseph Shada on behalf of the people of the state of Michigan. Are you going to be the only one making arguments? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. With me at council table, Chief <coughs> Assistant Prosecuting Attorney David Williams. I'd like to acknowledge the victims' families here today and the community members. I know this is a sensitive case. As this court knows, these four counts of involuntary manslaughter arise out of the deaths of the four students at Oxford High School on November 30th, 2021. Charging the parents of a shooter is rare, and frankly, it should be. It should be reserved for an egregious set of circumstances, an extreme set of facts that leave no doubt as to what a person using ordinary care. Are there any cases from anywhere in any other state where this has been upheld? It has never gotten to that juncture of the proceedings. It was charged in, I believe, Marshall County, uh, but the- it Marshall never, County, what's- where in, in Kentucky, okay. and uh, those charges were ended up dropped once there was a change in leadership at that so office. We have, we have no, no case law from anywhere across the state, across the country that supports the uh, situation we have here where parents are charged when their their child commits a obviously intentional act. There is no case law on these specific facts, but there is case law to support it in the general principles. Well, we now know though that EC's actions were intentional, right? You already have a plea, you've obtained convictions against the actual shooter, correct? Yes, that's correct, Your Honor. So what we're faced with here is not the more common situation where there's negligence that was foreseeable. What we're faced with here is a clearly intentional act that you're arguing was nonetheless foreseeable. Correct, Your Honor. And with it being an intentional act, the linchpin in this analysis is still one of reasonable foreseeability. And contrary to defendant's argument, this the intentional act was foreseeable. This is a case where months before the shooting, these parents knew he had reported hallucinations. They knew he had asked to go to the doctor, and they did nothing. Instead, eight months before the shooting. Correct. So maybe, like many parents, they hope that the situation will resolve itself, and maybe they're, they're hoping within that eight months. What legal duty did they, the parents have? You said in, in your brief that the, the, the parents violated a legal duty. What's that legal duty? Yes, Your Honor. The legal duty is that when a parent knows of the facts and circumstances giving rise to the necessity uh, and opportunity to exercise control over their child in order to prevent that minor child from harming another individual, uh, then they have a legal duty to act there. And that is the case law uh, articulated in Michigan. It is the case law articula articulated in the treatises, Lefebvre and Scott. Um, this legal duty, uh, the facts and circumstances of this case gave rise to that legal duty. But there was no safe storage law or anything in, in place where the parents had a duty to safely store the gun. 
No, Your Honor. That, th there are no laws currently regarding that. And uh, that is why there are two alternate theories. And the first theory is the lawful act theory of involuntary manslaughter. And the second is the legal duty theory. Will you speak just a moment to the question of whether the father bought the gun? Because they seem to contest that. Uh, I didn't read the record quite the same way that they did, but can you talk about that for a moment? I am unaware of the fact that he, their father bought the gun uh, being contested. Uh, the only evidence on this record indicates that he did buy the gun, the paperwork, the receipt, uh, the testimony uh, from the Miss Beck at the gun store was that defendant James Crumley bought this gun. And the mother, I thought, sent out a, a, a message or something on, on some kind of social media saying it's an early Christmas present for him. Yes, and that same caption referred to it as his gun right. in the sense of their son's gun. So is it your position then, at least on our review for abuse of discretion, that we essentially have to conclude that the father bought the gun and the mother supported giving the gun to him? Yes, Your Honor, that is the, what the record indicates. There are no facts to the contrary. And I think he said, uh, the, the, the EC himself said the gun was bought for him, didn't he? Correct. He referred to it as his gun in his own Instagram post as well, which both of these parents followed his Instagram account to which it was posted. Uh, and um, with... Uh, can I ask you a question? The, the um, I think um, one of the counsels made this point was that some of the text messages between EC and his friend um, were very enlightening about what was going on in, in EC's uh, mind. Um, but there's no evidence, is there, that either one of the defendants were aware of those text messages? Those particular text messages, no, but the point okay, of those... But, uh, sorry. All right, well, go ahead. I was going to say, the point of those text messages is they are evidence that he did, in fact, report the hallucinations and asked to go to the doctor to his parents. He said when he did so that uh, Defendant James Crumley gave him some pills and told him to suck it up, and Defendant Jennifer Crumley laughed at him. But that's, that's, that's the only evidentiary benefit of the, of the text message between EC and the friend. Correct. The okay. point of that is not to show that they, they knew of these text messages. It's to show that that occurrence happened. Uh, and with that occurrence happening, uh, these parents, instead of getting him help, uh, they, it, they told him to suck it up. They laughed at him. And they also knew that his best friend had moved away, that he was isolated. Uh, and instead of getting him help, they bought him a gun. They knew he was fascinated with guns. They, uh, he had posted the <coughs> targets to his Instagram, posted the pictures of the gun to uh, Instagram as well had targets on his bedroom wall, and he was proficient with that. But you know, when you when you just summarize that evidence, I, I, I couldn't help but think to someone in a perhaps a more rural area who is a, a family of hunters who buys a a fifteen or sixteen year old uh, a, a rifle to go deer hunting with, who best friend moved away, grandparent died, dog died, and was having you know, some tough times, and, and most kids at 15 or 16 are having a tough time with one thing or another anyway. Um, and now all of a sudden the, the, the hunting child goes off and shoots somebody, and now all of a sudden the parents are responsible for that? The key I mean, that's, that's basically what you just summarized. The key difference there, Your Honor, is it simply requires the use of ordinary care for that weapon. So it's not to say that nobody can have a gun, nobody can uh, use guns as hobbies with their children. It's the but, key. Then what, but then what differentiates that, where, where you have some signs that your child is having some emotional trouble at school, they're being bullied, whatever, and they also have a gun because they're, they, they enjoy you know, using guns for hunting and sporting and whatever, um, and then that child goes off and, and kills somebody. Why is that case different than what we have here? That case is different because of the level of knowledge that these parents had. They knew he had a fascination with guns. They knew that he was just gifted this gun days earlier. They knew of the graphic drawing that he had just made that had the words, the thoughts won't stop, help but, me. But even the school district or the counselor said being interested in guns is an acceptable hobby. There's nothing wrong with being interested in guns or letting children shoot. Heck, 
and all these American Legion posts mm -hmm. throughout the state have shooting classes for kids. Now, what's the precedent we're going to set here? I mean, there are a lot of families with kids who might not be as stable as the parents would like them to be. Is what sign, what's going to be the guidepost that we lay out for other cases to follow? Is it the kid's bullied at school, comes home complaining about that, lock up all the guns? Uh, is, uh, is it uh, the kid seems down, make sure the kid doesn't go to school? What, you know, what, what, what message are we going to send with, with this case here? The, the signs or guideposts, if you will, are simply the elements of this offense, and namely gross negligence, which requires the use of ordinary care. But d does it matter that the father was a straw purchaser when you talk about gross negligence or not? It, it certainly is a fact that can come into play. Um, it, it doesn't make or break the situation, but we know from how these parents referred to the gun that they thought of the gun as, as the child's. It was a gift to him. But is, is he, you know, and, and just focusing obviously on, on the causation, which is all we are dealing with, um, if, if, if the situation didn't happen on that day when they were called in to the school, if you took that out, and uh, instead, um, you know, one of the teachers didn't see the drawing or didn't see him watching the video, um, and then he just and he just went off and still did the shootings. Would it, would would there still be causation against these that would, defendants? That would be a much more difficult case to make with that factual variation and any factual variation. It's going to come down to the level of knowledge, and certainly what happened at the school there that day was a big piece of this picture and a big piece of this, these parents' knowledge. But what do you what do you fault the parents for most? Not opening the backpack, not taking them home from school, something else. Certainly, Your Honor. There are, the law does not prescribe one way in which ordinary care may be exercised. So there may be, there was a number of ways in which they could have exercised ordinary care to prevent this. So uh, they could have checked to see if he had the gun they just gifted him days earlier on him. They could have simply taken him home from school. They could have uh, adequately secured that weapon. Uh, there are a number of things that these parents could have done to exercise ordinary care in that situation. And they did none of them in, in this, this case. In the scenario Judge Murray just, just gave, this, the parents had one fact that the school district didn't know, and that was the text messages about the hallucinations in the kitchen to the mother and the whole thing. That's the only fact that the school district was not aware of, and that incident took place in March, as, as we've talked about earlier. So we're focusing in on the day in question, that Thursday, the school district had the exact same information as the parents. Exactly the same information. Kids distressed. Kid likes guns. The math drawings. Uh, the bullets the day before, surfing the internet looking for bullets during class. All the same information. Isn't the school district or the personnel there equally as culpable so as the parents, as, as uh, Ms. Smith said? I would, I would push back on that and say no. First, I would disagree that they had the same level of knowledge. Uh, these parents um, knew more, such as he was gifted that gun days earlier, that it was considered his, no, that he was they, 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 Having a gun, there's nothing illegal for parents buying a gun for their children. There's not, but it is And the school a, district even said it's a, it's a fine hobby. It Just is. Just don't bring it to school. It is, but they knew he had this gun while exhibiting uh, those thoughts on the drawing, the, the words on the drawing. They knew he was proficient with the gun. Well, the school district knew that he had a fondness for guns, too. The counselor knew that. I, I would still disagree, but even if we were to assume that the school and the parents had the same level of knowledge, the school is still not the entity who purchased this gun as a gift for their son. They're not the ones who failed to adequately secure it. But moreover, even if we were to assume that they were on the same level for all uh, intents and purposes, that still would not preclude criminal liability for these parents. And that's because... Well, you have prosecutorial, prosecutorial discretion, so you can charge whoever you want to charge. That's number one. But you also charged EC as an adult. Should that factor in? You consider him as an adult, the way, or the Oakland County Prosecutor's Office, the state considers him an adult, should that factor in our decision here? No, he's not, he's not a child. You're calling him an adult. No, it does not, Your Honor. And that's because the fact that he was subsequently charged as an adult 
does not retroactively go back and eliminate the duty that these parents had at that time to exercise care and control over this minor child. So he child. became an adult when he started shooting? He didn't become an adult. He still is the minor child, and that duty still applied. However, the fact that he subsequently was charged as an adult does not uh, go back and retroactively. Well, it does, but it does go to the point that, which is what the law says, the general overarching rule is that intentional acts are a superseding uh, intervening cause. And he sees considered an adult probably because he showed a lot of forethought in what he was doing. Uh, and his age, uh, although I guess the Supreme Court disagrees with that now. But, um, um, and and so here you have a technical adult committing first degree murder. Why in the world doesn't that constitute an intervening cause? Because the linchpin is still foreseeability. In the words, uh, as the words of Schaefer, Fiesel similarly states that this question is a question of reasonable foreseeability. But Re it, it doesn't that point that he was charged as an adult take this case a long way away from the head case it's, i mean head's a 10 and a nine year old it's it's certainly a different case uh, head and even bryson are, are different cases but it doesn't change the analysis it doesn't change the law that the linchpin in this analysis is reasonable foreseeability and that we are here on review there's no doubt that that's the linchpin of it but but when when the when the general overarching rule, I would, you know, repeating myself, is that intentional acts cut it, cut off respons criminal responsibility, don't you have to look at that? Look look at the foreseeability question with a little bit of a um, eye towards the intentional act not or, or being a superseding cause. If that's the general rule, that, that I mean, is it's got to be the rare exception under under a warrant. Absolutely, and it should be. Uh, it should be reserved only for those cases such as this, where it was foreseeable. And I think the best example of why uh, foreseeability is still the, this, the guiding consideration, despite the free and deliberate choice of another, um, is People v. Rideout. And that's 272 Mishap 602. In that case, uh, the co this court... Uh, address causation. And in the analysis of causation, it cited the exact free and deliberate choice language that defendants cite in the reply brief, and that come, uh, also was cited in People v. Zach. And in that case, it actually stated that the linchpin being foreseeability was a little bit of an overstatement, and it went on uh, to address that exact free and deliberate choice language. Subsequently, the Michigan Supreme Court reversed, and it reasoned, I quote, the Court of Appeals erred when it concluded that defendant's wrongful conduct could not be a proximate cause of the decedent's death. A reasonable jury could find the actions of the decedent were foreseeable based on an objective standard of reasonableness. Cite to Schaefer. Can so I ask you a question about uh, how foreseeability worked into the analysis? Because it looks like, as I read the circuit court opinion, there's a specific statement, the court further concludes that the criminal misconduct of the defendant's son was an intervening cause, but that a reasonable juror could conclude that his actions were reasonably foreseeable. Got it. But that's the circuit court reviewing in the same way that we are, the decision of the trial court, I mean, the district court. The district court really didn't say anything about foreseeability. I mean, the district court seemed to focus on what sounds like factual causation, but not proximate causation. The district court's focus was a little bit more heavily on uh, factual causation, but it nonetheless... Right, there's a whole paragraph that's clearly factual causation. Yes, Your Honor. And, you know, even if there were some, I guess, um, even if there was a lack of detail in the district court's oral decision, uh, the, it's still the right result. And even if it didn't fully articulate those reasons, the trial court, or the trial court certainly did, uh, and we in review of this denial of the motion to quash, the trial court uh, was within the range of reasonable principal outcomes here. And so I want to address uh, one point uh, that defendants made and that Judge Murray uh, had indicated, uh, the classic slippery slope argument. And defendants argue that there uh, should be concerns of widespread open liability. And that simply should not be the case. Because in order for there to be criminal liability under these theories, first, one's child has to go on and kill someone. But not only that, 
the parent has to be grossly negligent, meaning they must know of the facts and circumstances giving rise to the necessity to exercise reasonable care. And not only that, but they also must be able to prevent the ultimate harm with, and have the ability to prevent it with the exercise of ordinary care. So if there truly were a circumstance where the parents did not know of the necessity to act or they simply didn't have the ability to prevent the harm, then there would be no criminal liability. However, under these circumstances here, these parents knew he had a fascination with guns. They knew he was gifted this gun days earlier. They knew of the graphic drawing that he made, and they knew he was in crisis, yet they did nothing. Well, they knew he was in crisis, at least in March, they knew he was in crisis. Was he ever, ever medically diagnosed as with depression or any type of mental illness? That is not a fact on record. Uh, so um, in, in this course review, uh, essentially no. Okay. Um, but it, going back to their ability to prevent this tragedy, they could have, as indicated earlier, they simply could have taken him home. They could have checked to see if he had the gun on him that they purchased for him days earlier, or they could have adequately secured that in the first place. These parents had the knowledge that go, gave rise to the necessity uh, to exercise ordinary care, and they certainly had the ability to prevent it while using ordinary care. All right, thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Ms. Lehman, you have three minutes. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, I do not have a rebuttal argument, but if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Okay. Thank, thank you, Your Honors. And I, I, you, I, I didn't give you any warning, uh, and you went over. Are you okay? All right, thank you. Uh, no other questions, and thank you for your briefs and your arguments, and the case is submitted. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Yeah, have a good day.